Hello uh, and welcome to the third uh, of our NIHR Dementia Research uh, Midday uh, Lecture Webinars. Uh, I'm Adam Smith, I'm the Programme Director in the Office of the NIHR National Director for Dementia Research at UCL and today I'm delighted to welcome Dr Holly Walton. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, Holly is a research fellow at the Department of Applied Health Research at University College London. Her PhD focused on evaluating the implementation of complex interventions to improve independence in dementia and that will be the focus of today's lecture. Uh, you can find out more about Holly <laughs> through her bio which is published on the website. Uh, the talk will last around 20 minutes and then we've allowed 10 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom throughout the, uh, throughout the talk. And then what will happen is, is uh, once Holly has finished presenting, we'll uh, end the slides and I'll put the questions you've asked to Holly so she can answer live. Uh, we're also recording today's lecture, so if you drop out, don't worry, you can watch this back via our website at DementiaResearcher.com. Uh, nihr.ac.uk forward slash webinars um, from sometime later today or early tomorrow. So uh, thank you very much everybody for joining us and uh, Holly over to you if you could uh, share your screen now. Thank you all once again for joining uh, today. So as Adam mentioned we're going to be talking about my PhD research today and the focus is on the importance of measuring fidelity of delivery of and engagement with complex dementia interventions. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to the ESRC for funding my PhD uh, research, which did finish over a year and a half ago now. Um, and also, please do feel free to tweet um, during this presentation, either at Dementia Researcher or at my handle as well. So during today's talk, we're going to cover a few things. The first one is a very brief introduction to psychosocial interventions for dementia. And then we're going to go on to the main body of the talk, which is on the introduction to fidelity of delivery and engagement, why fidelity of delivery and engagement are important, examples of how to measure fidelity and engagement, and I'm going to be drawing on examples from my PhD research. And I'm also going to be giving um, some key highlight findings from my PhD research. But just to say, we haven't got a huge amount of time today, so I'm not going to be able to cover everything. But what I can do is give a hopefully a brief introduction so that if there's any further questions, you can ask me at the end or read further about it after the presentation today. So in recent years, there has been lots of initiatives to develop and evaluate interventions to support people with dementia and their family carers to maintain quality of life or independence, which is really, really good news. And actually quite a few reviews have shown promise for the effectiveness of such interventions. So you might ask, what is the problem uh, if, if this is the case? And actually, very few of these interventions have looked at fidelity of delivery or engagement. And so the consequence of this is that we do not always know whether interventions were delivered as planned or engaged with. And this basically means that we cannot fully understand why an intervention may or may not have been effective. And this is especially a problem when the interventions are complex. And as I'm sure lots of you know, if you work in dementia research, many of our interventions are complex. So they either have lots of interacting components or they might be delivered by lots of different providers across lots of different sites. So it might not be a straightforward one component intervention that can be delivered fairly easily. So this would be a lovely um, thing if this happened, if we could deliver our intervention and it very straightforward links to intervention outcomes, whether that be positive or negative ones. However, this is not always the case as there's lots of different things that influence whether or not an intervention is um, is going to lead to those intervention outcomes. And the ones that I'm going to focus on today are fidelity of delivery and engagement. So what do I mean by fidelity of delivery? And this basically means whether the intervention content was delivered as planned. So when the intervention developers uh, develop an intervention, they'll come up with a list of components. And we basically want to look at whether those components were delivered. And the second one that I'm going to focus on today is engagement. And to do this, I'm looking at two different constructs of engagement. The first one is intervention receipt. And this basically means whether participants understand the information that they were provided during an intervention. And the second part is intervention enactment. And this is whether they were able to carry out the skills that they learned during the intervention in their daily life. 
So um, the definitions that I'm using here are based on Bell Gatel's uh, NIHR Behaviour Change Consortium framework. And within that, there's also things like study design and training. But for the purpose of my PhD and this uh, presentation, I only focused on fidelity of delivery, intervention receipt and intervention enactment. And I've um, grouped receipt and enactment under engagement as an umbrella term to focus on what participants can do to help uh, the intervention and what providers can do to help the intervention. So fidelity of delivery being the provider behaviour and engagement being the participant behaviour. So why is it important to consider fidelity and engagement? Well, as I've just alluded to in the previous slide, it can help us to understand intervention outcomes if we know how the intervention is delivered and engaged with. And it can also help us to find out if there's been type one errors, so if there's been a false positive, and um, so whether it looks like the intervention is effective, but actually it might have been affected by other factors other than the intervention, for example, the provider going and sitting with the person and having a nice conversation or something else like that. And it can also help us to understand type two errors, so this is the opposite, so false negative um, outcomes. So this might be where we think that an intervention is no good and discard it when actually it might just be that the intervention wasn't delivered as it should have been or wasn't engaged with by the participants. There's also a question of whether there's links with outcome and uh, previous research suggests that engagement and outcome might be positively linked. Uh, so better engagement might link, lead to better outcome. However, for fidelity, it's less clear. So some researchers have suggested that high fidelity leads to better outcomes. Some have suggested that moderate fidelity might lead to better outcomes. And others have actually suggested that strict adherence to protocols, so high fidelity, might actually jeopardise uh, intervention outcomes and go the opposite way. So it's less known, but there, there is that potential that it might have that effect on outcomes. There's also an ethical question um, which I want to put to you all, which is when does the intervention not become the intervention? And when does that have ethical dilemmas? So should we be delivering something that isn't planned to be delivered? And when might it actually become potentially harmful and this might not always be the case for psychological and social interventions that we work with but if you think about it for other interventions there might be a point when actually we might be delivering uh, components that are not part of the planned intervention they might not be evidence-based and things like that and actually there's quite a lot of literature that suggests that interventions are often not delivered as planned and this isn't necessarily the dementia interventions but this can be interventions for other complex health uh, behaviours such as smoking cessation and other things like that. Now when I was putting this talk together I wanted to think about why it's particularly important to consider fidelity and engagement for dementia interventions and one of the first points that I wanted to make is that actually the symptoms that come with the diagnosis of dementia may actually make it more difficult for participants to engage. Therefore as researchers it's really important that we understand whether participants can engage with an intervention and try to help them engage wherever possible so to put things in place so that they can do this and also as many of you will know many dementia interventions are person-centered and tailored and actually what this might mean is that we might be delivering standardized components which all participants receive and we might also be delivering tailored interventions which participants may choose to receive uh, depending on what the intervention looks like and so it's really important that we know exactly what's delivered for both the standardised components and also the more tailored aspects of the intervention. It's also recommended from the Medical Research Council that we measure fidelity and engagement as part of a process evaluation in order to understand how and whether an intervention works. So the two interventions that I'm giving examples from today of the Promoting Independence in Dementia Intervention, which is a psychological and social tailored manual based intervention, and it aims to improve independence for people with dementia and their supporters. And this intervention was a feasibility trial, so it was delivered over three sessions over three months, and it was delivered across four sites in England. And actually, this is a prime example of an intervention that has both standardised components that all of the participants receive, but it also had tailored components where participants chose what topics to work on throughout the intervention. The second intervention that I'd like to focus on today is the Community Occupational Therapy in Dementia UK intervention. 
And this is an occupational therapy intervention that aims to improve independence, meaningful activity and quality of life. And this was also delivered to people with dementia and their family carers. And as you can see from the slide, this is a much uh, larger trial. So this is a multi-center, pragmatic, single blind, randomized control trial to delivered to quite a lot more people. And in this intervention, uh, 10 hours of occupational therapy were delivered. And this was delivered over seven key sessions. So how can we measure fidelity and engagement? So many different methods have been used. And for fidelity, uh, the research suggests that a combination of observation, self-report measures and multiple measures have been used. One option is to audio record all sessions and use multiple researchers to reliably rate percentage of components delivered within sessions. Um, and this is one way you'd uh, reliably rate a percentage of transcripts. So you wouldn't rate all of the sessions for fidelity, but you would rate a certain amount of sessions. For engagement, the research has suggested that self-report, attendance records and multiple measures have also been used. However, there's less consensus for, for engagement on what the best way of measuring engagement is. And as I'm sure you can think, actually engagement is quite tricky because the outcomes and the engagement measures might actually be crossing over in some ways. So that's just something to be mindful of. That actually, how do we measure engagement distinct from intervention outcomes? So as with any research and any measurement, we need to make sure that fidelity and engagement measures are trustworthy. And so when we're developing and reporting on these measures, we need to be reporting the psychometric qualities such as reliability and validity and the implementation qualities such as acceptability and practicality. However, uh, a review of complex health behaviour change interventions that I did at the start of my PhD found that considerations of quality are very rarely reported in fidelity studies. So just to give you an example here, 74.2% uh, reported at least one psychometric quality, but only 25.8% reported at least one implementation quality. And actually that's quite um, quite low considering the fact that we need to make sure that people can use these measures if um, we're going to be asking them to complete reports on whether the intervention was delivered as planned or engaged with. So the take home from this is that authors need to consider and report quality when measuring fidelity and engagement in complex health interventions. So when I started my PhD, I felt that there was a lot on what type of measures should be used to measure fidelity, but I couldn't find as much on how to develop high quality fidelity and engagement measures. So I felt that guidance was needed. And so as part of the PhD, we developed practical recommendations for developing fidelity and engagement measures. And we've proposed five steps that can be used to develop uh, fidelity and engagement measures. So the first step is to review previous measures that are used in the field and to see if they apply to yours in terms of the scale that they've used, the wording that they've used and that sort of thing. The second part is then to go through the intervention uh, documents. This could be your intervention manual, it could be your training slides, anything that kind of outlines what the intervention should look like. And what you'll do is you'll go through this manual and you'll pick out the key components that should be delivered to participants as part of the intervention. And from this, you'll then develop a framework which says what should be delivered in each session and what the intervention should look like on a whole. From this, you can then develop fidelity checklists and coding guidelines. So I would recommend that you develop a fidelity checklist for each intervention session and also a coding guideline to go with that fidelity checklist. And the coding guidelines should outline what the component is, what the definition of that component is, and what the, what the provider would have to do for the component to be delivered fully to some extent or not at all. The fourth step then is to obtain feedback on the content and wording of the checklist and guidelines. And this is really important, especially if you're going to be giving the um, coding guidelines and checklists to uh, participants or providers because they need to actually be able to use them. And so they need to be practical for them to fill in. And so it's good to get feedback on those to refine them before we move on to the next stage. And then the final stage, which is important if you're doing research ratings of observations, is to pilot your checklist and refine them to see if reliability can be achieved. So for our studies, this meant trying to achieve over 0.6 weighted kappa three times in a row for each checklist. And we amended the coding guidelines until that happened. And just to say, we've used these five steps for both of the intervention fidelity assessments with some minor changes depending on the uh, individual study. For example, for Cotage UK, we didn't um, 
ask participants to fill in checklists so we didn't need to ask for public patient involvement feedback on the checklist in that study, whereas we did in the PRIDE intervention. So just to give you some examples, for PRIDE we developed three checklists, one for each session, and we developed two versions, one for the provider and researcher to complete and one for the participant to complete. So this is the session two checklist for the provider and the researcher. And this basically lists all of the standardized components that you can see down the side. So one to 17, they were the components that needed to be delivered. And I also mentioned tailored components. So when the participant chose to work on a certain topic, we then asked the providers and researchers to fill in this additional grid to highlight which tailored components were delivered as part of that topic so that we could monitor that. And we asked providers and researchers to say whether they were done, done to some extent or not done. For the participants, the standardized components were the same, but as you can see, we also have some engagement questions such as this one. So since the last session, I've practiced and used the information and skills I learned. And we asked them to say yes to some extent or no. Then for the fidelity questions, we asked them to say whether components definitely happened, possibly happened or didn't happen. For Coated UK, on the other hand, we developed six checklists and coding guidelines, and this was one for each key skill, with the exception of uh, the summary and goal setting skills, which were two distinct skills. But we decided to um, combine these together so that we could um, measure these in the same time, because often they were delivered at the same time. So as you'll see, there's one to 15 components down the side there that should have been delivered in that session. So for PRIDE, we audio recorded all sessions and transcribed and coded 60% of sessions with the fidelity checklist that I've just shown you. And 10% of sessions were double coded by a second researcher to ensure that reliability was maintained after developing the checklist. We also asked all of the providers and all of the people with dementia to uh, fill out the participant and provider checklist so that we knew what was delivered uh, from their perspectives. And uh, we also asked participants to complete the engagement questions on the checklist so we could find out how much they engaged with the intervention. For Coated UK, we also audio recorded all of the sessions and transcribed and coded 10% of sessions with the checklist. And again, a second researcher coded 10% to make sure that reliability was maintained. So just to give you a highlight of our key findings, uh, for, for PRIDE we found that fidelity ranged from moderate to high, uh, depending on which rating we were using. So for the audio recordings, they indicated that the three sessions were delivered on average with, from, with um, moderate fidelity, which ranged from 54.9% to 69%, so that's the average of the three sessions. The provider and participant self-report, on the other hand, indicated that the fidelity to the components was very high. So the percentage of components delivered for these was more in the 80s and 90%. So it's quite a bit different in that sense. It's a lot higher than the audio recorded ratings. For engagement, the checklist that the participants completed indicated that they engaged with the intervention and this was around 90% on average. For Coated UK, we also found that uh, fidelity was moderate. So the delivery of components in the seven key sessions ranged from 52% to 75%. So again, there's quite a bit of variation there. And whilst fidelity was at least moderate in both of the interventions, we did find that fidelity ranged across providers and sites and interventions as well. So it wasn't consistent across the board. So for PRIDE, we then wanted to find out what helped and got in the way of fidelity and engagement. So we carried out a semi-structured interview uh, study with providers, people living with dementia and supporters. And we analysed this using thematic analysis and content analysis. Now, I haven't got time to go into all of the findings today, but I just wanted to highlight the key themes that came up. So for fidelity, the key factors that influence fidelity were knowledge, providers' attributes, ease of adaptation of the intervention in relation to the participants' needs and logistical considerations. For engagement, on the other hand, the factors were participants' attributes, capability and opportunity. Now, as you've seen, the behaviours that we've uh, just spoke about had quite a few factors that influenced them. So these were factors that helped and got in the way. And what this shows is that fidelity of delivery and engagement are complex behaviours with many interlinked factors and mechanisms influencing behaviour.
So understanding the barriers and facilitators can actually help us to develop strategies to improve fidelity and engagement. And we can do this using behaviour change theories and frameworks such as the behaviour change wheel. Now, what I'm not going to cover today is how to do this, but if anybody's interested, this was the final part of my PhD research. So I developed some recommendations uh, to improve fidelity and engagement. So I can go through that if, if needed, or I can send you some more information if you're interested. So just to summarize my key messages before we go on to the Q&A. The first one is that, and these are the summary of my key messages from my overall PhD project. So researchers developing and evaluating complex interventions for dementia and other conditions as well need to consider and measure both fidelity of delivery and engagement. Researchers also need to consider and report quality when measuring fidelity and engagement in complex health interventions. And measures of fidelity and engagement can be developed by following the five recommended steps that I proposed earlier. And as I mentioned, we did use these steps for both of the interventions. And as you saw at the beginning, they were quite distinct interventions. They have different components, different amounts of sessions, different providers. But actually, the measures that we use did apply um, across both of the interventions. So hopefully that gives you some confidence that you could use these in your own interventions if, if applicable. From our interventions, we can indicate that there's a reasonable degree of confidence in the intervention effects because both Pride and Coated UK were delivered moderately as planned and Pride was also engaged with by participants. However, we did find that for Pride especially, fidelity of delivery and engagement are quite complex behaviours and actually they have many interlinked factors and mechanisms influencing behaviour. So we do need to take this into account when thinking about how to implement interventions on a wider scale across different sites, across populations and other things like that as well. So that's just something to bear in mind. So thank you for listening. I'm going to go to questions in a minute, but I just quickly wanted to acknowledge my supervisors, all of the wider Pride and Valid research teams and the participants who took part in the research. Um, I'm just going to flick through the references very quickly so that you can pause these if you're watching on YouTube later on um, to see what references I used and just to highlight the funding statements for both of the research programmes as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Holly. You can uh, end your screen share now. Uh, that was fascinating. I think I, I can absolutely see how you could come back to, to dive into that last point you made there in a completely separate discussion. Okay, so um, if anybody has any questions uh, who haven't put them already, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom there to, to add questions and I'll put those to Holly now. Um, we do have um, a few coming in, so <clears throat> you'll have to apologise me for my pronunciation of, of names. Um, so first of all, uh, Rui Pinto says, is fidelity a question of individual liberty about solidarity? solidarity property hmm. I'm, I'm not sorry. sure I understand that question yeah, I'm <laughs> sure I understand um, that question but this is to do with whether um, dementia interventions are delivered as planned by the providers um, mm. but also whether the participants can engage with the intervention um, so it's about the individual behaviors on both sides of that I'm not sure that answers your question but just to kind of well, if you want to follow up on that, uh, Rui, you can, you can by all means uh, add another point b below. Um, we've got a question from Jay McD. Uh, any immediate thoughts on how I might go about this when there are two components to the intervention? Uh, number one, online learning materials, and number two, live uh, online coaching sessions. Yeah, so um, obviously the interventions that I've covered today were more face-to-face -face, uh, delivery, but what I would say is you can think about it in terms of breaking down um, the intervention into those things. So if there's like different live online coaching sessions, you might deliver different components within each of those sessions. So you could um, develop checklists for each of the online coaching sessions. If they're different or if they're repeated, they could have the same checklist. Um, in terms of the online learning materials, Again, you could kind of break that down into what components are delivered throughout those materials. And then you could look at what, I mean, if they're online, they're presumably going to be delivered as planned because they're a set um, content program. But it might be that the engagement becomes more of a question there in terms of whether people do go through them 
as you intend them to. So whether people actually uh, read all of the learning materials, whether they actually listen to all of the live online coaching sessions, whether they attend and things like that. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. But with online interventions, fidelity might be less of a problem because you've got that standardized delivery of the online material, if that helps. I suppose, do you have a second issue there where you depend, uh, You have to kind of make sure that people can only do it once, for example, and not practice and rehearse? Because I, I could imagine with an online, if there's some quiz or something at the end where you're looking to validate the result if people practice, which is obviously yeah. always one of the qu issues with potentials for online cognitive testing and things like that, that people yeah. play it again and again. Yeah, so definitely. So it might be something that you need to think about whether you can kind of control how much they can access that material or how many times they can do it and things like yeah, that. Yeah, the timing of things and the time of day and things like that, I suppose, looking at Google has some very clever tools, doesn't it, to look at how long how long somebody took to do something as well, yeah. whether somebody took longer and got a better result than somebody yeah. who did it shorter. And things. Yeah, so you should definitely record all of those things so that you can report it when, uh, when describing the intervention and the outcomes later on. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a question from Remco. How do you think involving participants in measuring their own fidelity of programme affects the potential outcomes of the intervention? Yes, this is a really good question. And as with any measurement, we can be influencing um, outcomes by just by doing the questionnaire. Um, and actually, this is a problem for all measures of fidelity and not just uh, participant self-report, I think because even just observing uh, the sessions, so audio recording the sessions might make the providers change their behavior. Um, by asking providers to complete a checklist, you're kind of giving them a set of what they should be doing in the interventions. So that also, um, we found in the interviews particularly, that also was making people think about what they were delivering um, more readily than they might have if they didn't have the checklist. Um, and in terms of the participants, it could, um, it could influence how they then engage with the intervention potentially. Um, but what we did was we basically asked people to complete the relevant session checklist straight after the session um, and then post it back to the, to the researchers. So hopefully then by the next session, which was kind of a month apart, it was kind of uh, less, less of a focus than what it would have been immediately after the session, if that makes sense. Um, but really good question. Um, I'm not sure we can avoid it. I think it's just something we've got to kind of um, mention in the kind of write-up of the intervention and kind of in the acknowledgement when we're using these measures that it might have affected people's behaviour. Thank you, Remco. Uh, another question from Katie Powers. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. You mentioned that practitioners' attributes affected fidelity. Which attributes were identified? Yes, so this again is a bigger discussion because there is tons of findings and themes and sub themes that I would like to have gone into uh, today but just to give you and if you're interested please uh, get in touch and I can share the the write-up with you um, but just to give you a flavor it was things like um, the providers sort of uh, own attitudes towards the intervention and also towards kind of their fears of kind of how they delivered it, their anxieties about delivering it and that sort of kind of attribute in that sense but also um, I mean knowledge comes up in a, in a theme of its own but also knowledge on how to deliver the intervention whether they felt they had the necessary skills to be able to deliver it as planned and things like that. So it's, it's quite a complex answer that I'm probably not going to be able to go into in too much depth right now but um, there was lots of uh, factors that did influence uh, fidelity, um, and yeah, it was it was it was quite an interesting um, finding, I think, because I thought it was going to be mainly sort of your sort of knowledge and your logistical considerations, such as time and that sort of thing. But actually, there was ones that were more to do with uh, sort of fear of doing it right, which probably is a result of measuring things like fidelity and stuff like that as well. So that was really interesting. Thank you, Katie. Uh, we, we should add that um, if anybody does have questions that they want to follow up with, um, um, Katie, uh, um, Katie Holly is on Twitter at Holly Walton 15. Uh, we will also uh, post this and you'll have a chance to ask questions and follow up afterwards as well. We've got another question from Stefani. Uh, what made you choose to examine fidelity and engagement at the expense of other process factors? Yeah. Again, a really good uh, question. Um, to be honest, the, um, 
the kind of PhD topic that I looked at was funded as part of the larger trial before I um, began. So fidelity and engagement were kind of uh, part of that in terms of the process evaluation aspects that they wanted uh, to be delivered. But I think it's a really good question. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different process factors. Um, I think I personally was quite interested in the, the behaviours relating to the providers and the participants. Uh, so the providers delivering the intervention as planned, engagement, whether the participants engage with the intervention from a behaviour science point of view. It's really interesting to see what kind of factors influence that. Um, but equally, um, I think it's a really important question and actually as part of the pride intervention the feasibility trial was looking at a lot of more wider factors such as feasibility and acceptability and all of that sort of thing as well so it's kind of to complement what was already going on in the larger uh, interventions but no really good question there uh, thank you very much we've got a question from um from priya that says thank you for the presentation holly to what extent do you think participants feel pressured to report what they've implemented and the skills learned regardless of whether or not they have uh, which might uh, compromise measurement of engagement yeah um yeah i mean this is a this is a floor of self-report uh, measures um and i think just so I know you've mentioned about the question being on the engagement but also if we think about um, fidelity as well it's also uh, relevant in terms of people reporting what was delivered. For fidelity we did try to mitigate against it because in the pride checklist we had a question um, that said uh, please make notes here to say why it wasn't delivered and actually in the training what we did was we said to people it's absolutely fine not to deliver all of the components because in a real set in a real life situation you're probably not going to be able to deliver all of the components it's just that we need to understand what is being delivered so it was more kind of for the providers putting them at ease that we're not expecting them to deliver everything and kind of giving them an option if they want to to let us know why whether it was that they ran out of time or whether it was just that they didn't think it was suitable for that person that was absolutely fine but we just kind of highlighted that we needed to know um what was delivered so that we could understand the intervention and the same with the participants we um sent them kind of a little brief sheet about how to complete the checklist and within that that we explained that people might not have sort of delivered everything um and that was okay but we just wanted to get a sense of what was delivered um but admittedly people might have wanted to tell me that they were engaging with the intervention um, even if they wasn't but that's why we also had the interview part of the study because we then spoke to people and said what helped and got in the way and we then kind of got more perspectives on where they might not have been fully engaged with and kind of where they sort of um, where those uh, self-report issues may have come into play um, but I think it was really important to get people's views on what they felt was delivered from their perspective and what they felt they engaged with. It is tricky, isn't it? I know we've done some work with pharmacists before and I've, I've because we didn't measure this, of course, what I've never been quite sure is, is whether the, the issue was is that pharmacy just wasn't the best place to deliver this intervention or if it was that pharmacists weren't engaging with the process. So uh, in hindsight, I wish we'd focus more on that myself for some for some research we did. Um, thank you very much for that question. We've got another one from Keir Bridger. Thank you for sharing. If there's any time I'd be interested in what influential provider attributes were uh, affecting fidelity? Yeah, so thank you, Kay. So as I mentioned, there were things uh, to do with emotional factors such as uh, fear and that sort of thing. Um, there was also bits to do with experience and the provider's experience. Uh, so how many years they'd kind of been doing uh, that sort of work. Um, there was also how long they'd been delivering the intervention in, in that the intervention was new to all of the providers, but some of the providers might have had more experience, had more uh, participants that they were delivering to and things like that. Um, again, I think this is one for me to send you more details after the call, if that's okay. So yeah, please do get in touch and I can send you a more in-depth breakdown. Thank you, Kay. Um, uh... Uh, Samir, uh, Saime, Samir, I'm oh, sorry, I'm terrible with pronunciations of names. Uh, what were the challenges you faced during the field work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and they could be varied, right? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, um, to be fair, I was quite lucky in that uh, both of the interventions that I worked on um, 
ended up going really well in terms of the logistics and things but I think some of the challenges um were kind of things like uh, te technology challenges so um audio recorders might not always work with every computer um there might be missing data if if audio recorders sort of delete the files and things like that that was quite challenging um i guess as well because with this sort of work you're working within a limited sample so you haven't got a whole population to sample from you've only got kind of uh the sample that was uh, collected during the intervention that you can then take sort of so for like the interview study and things uh, we we kind of had to hope that people might take part but we could only ask obviously those who'd received the intervention and I was very very lucky in that lots of people did take part um, so that I could get those views but I think in that sense it you can't sample more people if, if you don't find enough people it you've, you've kind of got quite a contained um, contained group of people that you can uh, work with. Um, I think it particularly also as well depends on environment doesn't it? I mean we know that different uh, care home interventions delivered in care home settings for example are particularly difficult with technology or the staff time to, to do these. I think environment and place and timing is important too. Yeah but we but we tried to sort of mitigate as many challenges as we could so um before the study we realized that sometimes self-report might be quite low so we we put lots of things in place so that people could literally put the checklist in a prepaid envelope which already had the address on and just literally put it in the post box back to me rather than kind of having to go out of their way to to do anything so we yeah, we, make really it as possible. yeah we tried to sort of um preempt those challenges with the technology and, and also with post and things to make sure that we could hopefully make it as easy as possible for people to take part which goes back to the acceptability and practicality bit that I mentioned earlier that you need to really make sure that that is okay for people before you start the study. Thank you for that question Simon. Um, now we've got Kate Radford. Uh, where multiple methods of fidelity assessment are being used, example checklists, observations and interviews, how should the mixed methods data be synthesized to determine fidelity or should each method be treated separately? Yeah, so this, this is a really good question and um, the way that I've kind of approached it. So if we take the fidelity assessment, which so I had the fidelity assessment from the audio recording ratings, the fidelity assessment from the provider ratings and the fidelity assessment from the participant ratings. What I did was I analysed them separately initially so that I could see as I gave you the, re the researcher rating said moderate, the participant said high, the provider said high. And then what, um, what you've not seen is there's a much more in-depth analysis with graphs that show which components people um, sort of disagreed on. So then you can start to pull apart. Okay, to be fair, they're probably both valid, um, valid, even though they're different, they're both probably valid reports because actually, so the researcher ratings, for example, we haven't got a visual on what was being delivered. So they might have been giving forms to participants, but we can only go on what we then hear. So each of them have got their own limitations. So we kind of analyzed them separately, triangulated them where we could, and then use that to come up with sort of a, a picture of what was being delivered. And then we use the interviews to give us a, a more thorough sense of what the barriers and facilitators are, which then gave us a much more three dimensional picture of what was being delivered and how the challenges influenced the delivery and practice. Um, and then what we did was we combined the fidelity assessment, so the numbers, with the interview data to then develop the strategies to improve fidelity. So it was then, it was that last stage that I've not gone through today where I then put them together to really inform how we would then go about improving that in future. But I don't think there's a right or wrong in terms of whether they should be treated separately, whether they should be combined. I think if you can combine them to give a much more three-dimensional view that that's good but it depends on what you're trying to do my I suppose my fidelity study was very much a very in-depth one because it was the basis of my PhD thesis whereas a, whereas another process evaluation might be uh, obviously less resource intensive and things like that so you've kind of got to do what works within within the situation as well. Good question Kate and, and Holly you're always welcome to come back and do another one to go into more detail on that. Um, we've got a question from Ying Lee. Um, have there been has there been much work on fidelity and engagement with digital interventions obviously as uh, particularly smartphone apps we did touch on this uh, right at the start didn't we with another question are you aware of any particular work on that 
so not in dementia research I'm not aware of it however um one of my PhD colleagues uh, Dr Olga Persky did a lot of work in her PhD on um, engagement with digital interventions. So it's not something I touched on because mine were all face to face. But if you're interested in digital engagement, have a look at Olga's work because uh, she's done a huge amount of stuff with engagement. What, what was her name again? Can you say that again? Olga Persky. Olga Persky, uh, also at UCL. Yeah, so she's also at UCL, yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're down to our last three questions. Uh, Abigail Lee says, thank you for an interesting talk. How would you recommend measuring fidelity when studying online interventions that, are, that have a face-to-face -face training component? I don't know if we've ad addressed that question. Some of the others, do you have anything to add to what you've already said? Yeah, so, so again, I probably can't advise on the online part as much just because I haven't done that. However, with the face-to-face -face training component, what I would say it might be worth doing is is developing a checklist for that aspect of the study and even the online part for the engagement but in particular the face-to-face -to, -face to see what's being delivered um, during that training component might be really worthwhile um, but no I think there's a lot of work needed to be done in terms of fidelity in those interventions that use multiple modalities because I think that's a really interesting how do you then balance both to make sure that you're doing the face-to-face -face fidelity work justice and the online yeah. work justice? So. Uh, Abigail, we do also have a, a WhatsApp community group of early career researchers. That has about 100 early career researchers in there. Um, on our website, if you go to the top and then go to one of the menu options is ask an expert, you can find details on how to, how to join that group. So if you wanted to raise this point there, that's a good community of people to have a conversation with and get their ideas uh, into that, uh, into how you might measure that as well. I know we've seen there's a lot of online digital tools and measurements that I think that group might be able to have a few suggestions on. Uh, last two questions. Uh, Johnny uh, says, thanks for the talk. Sorry if you mentioned it, but who answers the checklist given to the participant? The participant themselves or their carers or the participant directly? Uh, if it is the participant directly, would their cognitive problems add noise to the measures of fidelity or engagement? That's a good question. Who yeah. completes it, Ollie? <laughs> yeah, so it is a very good question. So in, in our study, uh, the intention was for the person with dementia to complete the checklist. And I believe that did happen in many cases. However, in some cases, I think the family supporter might also have completed it. And there's no way of us telling what happened there in that sense. But from the interviews, we definitely got a sense that in some cases it was the person with dementia who completed it and in other cases it was the supporter. And this is something that I acknowledged in my uh, thesis as a limitation because we didn't preempt that beforehand. We did ask for the person with dementia to complete it, but it, it, you can't have that control when it's being done in someone's home and then they're posting it back to you. So as long as somebody completed it, we were, we were pleased with that. Um, in terms of the last part of the question, we asked them to complete it straight after the intervention session. So the provider, when they left the uh, session, they provided the participant with the checklist and the envelope and the guideline and said, if possible, please, could you complete this and then send it back to the researchers at UCL sort of thing. Um, and the provider didn't stay for that, for that part of the completion of the checklist, um, because obviously that could have also influenced how people filled the checklist in. Um, so we asked the providers to leave it with the participant and the supporter. Um, but yeah, in, in, in some cases, we believe it was the person with dementia who completed it and they did it straight after the, after the intervention session. Which Is it, is it at least possibly worth at least adding that in as a question? So, you know, we saying who you want to complete it in, but then ask and say, if they didn't complete it, who did? So yeah. you could at least look at the differences between them as well. Yeah, so in hindsight, that would have been... Um, the, the good thing to do I think so in future I think we sh you should uh, think about that um, and also making sure that the ID numbers and everything are pre-filled in printed on the checklist so that it's easy for the provider and for the participant to make sure they send it back and um, it's all of those kind of little detail oriented bits that make it kind of easier for everybody involved um, but and if you're doing that digitally I know that there are some clever ways you'd have to look into this I've done this myself for some <coughs> follow-ups of of creating unique tags and things like that so that they can be pre-populated automatically from the link somebody clicks for example and that can follow all the way through to look at 
how long somebody took to answer the questions, uh, which person it was, but just through ID numbers as well. It doesn't have to be names, but you do have to create each one uniquely then. So it's, it's a little bit of a work to be involved. Um, should we take our final question, which yeah. is from uh, Emma Broom, uh, which is when planning an intervention study, how much time or resource should you account for developing a fidelity and engagement measure? Good question. Yeah, so Emma, that's a really good question. So this is, I think, the tricky thing for fidelity studies. And I think they need to be resourced well, because it does take two researchers to develop a t to develop a tool effectively. So if you're going to do the, re I can't even speak, sorry, the reliability analyses that I mentioned earlier to make sure that the coding's consistent across researchers, it does take a fair bit of time. Each transcript takes a good hour to code by each person. And then you've got to meet to discuss the coding. You've got to amend the coding guidelines. So that takes time. The coding of intervention components takes time. Um, but what I would definitely advise if you're doing audio recording or video recording, I would definitely add in resources for transcription because that is a huge <laughs> part of the study. So I was very fortunate in that for both of the interventions I worked on, we had professional transcription companies uh, transcribing the data. And I don't know if I could have done it in as, in as quick time had that not have happened because it would have took forever to transcribe all of those sessions um, and code them and develop the measure. So I would just say um, plan in enough time to go through all the documents to develop the measure, plan in two researchers to make sure the reliability is there. Um, as a PhD student, I was quite reliant in one of the interventions in particular for my fellow PhD colleagues helping out in some of that situation. So I think if it's a full fidelity study that you can resource that, it's, it's a good idea to do so. Um, it'll just make life a lot easier in the long run and mean that you can do it a lot more efficiently. And, and I think I know having had to use some transcription services recently, if you find some, there will be a department in your university that whose job it is to organize transcription, particularly with the push for all online digital content to now be accessible. Everything that's appearing on websites is supposed to have, you know, audio read out versions and, and yeah. things like that. So there will be somebody there. I think I was paying about for a third, I don't know how much you were paying Holly. I was paying, I've been paying about 150 pounds for a half an hour. Mm. Was that a lot? Was that cheap? <laughs> so, so generally from my experience of qualitative transcription research, generally, most of the ones that I've used have been about a pound a minute audio recorded but, but oh, whoa, what a pound a minute i've been getting ripped off <laughs> the timing is so it depends how many days you want it back within so yeah. after we go for sort of two week time frame so you just have to plan that in as a part of the study that you'll wait two weeks for your transcript to come back but if you do want them quicker as adam mentioned the price then increases quite steeply so just make sure when you're doing your costings for this this type of study that you really think about that. And I would say don't under resource the fidelity study. I think it's, it always seems like a side part of the intervention, which, which obviously isn't the main, it's not the main song and dance of an intervention study, but it is going to be really helpful in helping you to interpret your results. And it, and it does take quite a lot of time and resources to do it well. So I'd just say, just make sure to plan that in if you can. Uh, absolutely and if you get to the end and you haven't done that you just don't know if what what went wrong do you you don't know if it was the intervention that didn't work or, or you know it could have yeah. just been how it was done thank you very much for that question emma that's the last of our questions so um i would just we've gone slightly over time but i i think the questions were all really interesting and so i'm glad we did to get answers to those thank you very much holly we're delighted that you agreed to share with us today. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, if anybody has any questions, you can uh, find Holly on Twitter, which is um, at hollywalton15, numeric. Uh, we'll also be posting the recording from today's webinar on our website very soon. Um, our next webinar, I think at the moment, we're just finalizing the schedule, will be on Thursday, the 16th of April with uh, Dr. James Quinn, who will be discussing how to choose and find the right postdoc. Uh, the recording from today's and details on all of our future webinars and schedule can be found on our website, dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk forward slash webinars.
Um, finally, if you'd like to join us and present your own research as a midday lecture, please drop us a line uh, either on Twitter and you'll find us at dem underscore researcher or DM is using the contact details on our website. So thank you very much everybody again for joining us and thank you Holly uh, for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you for hosting Adam. Thank you. <laughs>